Welcome to the podcast, Your Future in Sales and Marketing, the podcast that helps you make great career decisions. My name is Mike Dixon, and I'm a professional sales and marketing recruiter. I love what I do, but my biggest frustration is seeing too many people not realizing their career potential. In this podcast, I'll introduce you to my network, an amazing group of business leaders from the biggest tier one organizations through to some super fast growth SMEs. They'll share their career journeys and give unique advice and insights on managing your career and leading a function and a business. Join me, Mike Dixon of AXR Recruitment and Search to help guide your future in sales and marketing. Well, hello and welcome to the podcast, Your Future in Sales and Marketing, with me, Mike Dixon, Director of AXR Recruitment and Search. Our purpose at AXR is to help you make great career decisions by giving you access to the insights and expertise of our network of amazing senior leaders. Today, we have a very different pod, a step outside of sales and marketing and into the world of HR. I'm meeting two of my favorite HR leaders, Nellie Tierney of Campari and Karen Coyle of William Grant and Sons. Nelly. Karen, welcome to the pod. How are you both? We're good, Mike. Nice yes, to see you. Certainly an introduction. Very happy to be here. Thanks for having us. You're most welcome. Now we're going to start as usual with a look at the career journeys of Nelly and Karen and then spend most of our time getting inside that HR perspective and taking the opportunity to ask two fantastic HR leaders about career management. So let's get into it. And uh, first question, as always, is the icebreaker, what's your favorite brand? Karen, do you want to start? Well, if it's not a brand that I've worked with, then it's absolutely Veuve Champagne. It just makes me feel amazing every time I see the bottle. Fantastic. Okay, Nelly? Uh, well, I I think Virgin Group of Brands is probably, um, I think their principles are consistent across every channel of business. And um they, whilst they're focused on value for money, they still bring in that playfulness and the fun, contemporary feeling, um, regardless of what area of the business that you're looking at. So, Virgin for me. Fantastic. Um, well, certainly, uh, based on where we are right now, we're recording in uh, September uh, 2023. I think Qantas could take a leaf out of Virgin's book just now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Great. Um, now, a bit about where you're from. Uh, we'll stick with you, Nelly, first of all. So where are you from? Tell us about life before the world of HR. Yeah, for sure. I grew up in the western suburbs of Sydney and um, we were in a neighbourhood with a lot of people living below the poverty line. And I think... Um, you get appreciation for what hard work really is at a young age. I found my moral compass uh, and learned the importance of values and behaviours and experiences over, um, I guess, money and p- material possessions really early. That's awesome. Karen, where are you from? I, I, I can answer partly where you're from because we, we share a similar accent. But uh... We do, we do. So I'm from Glasgow. Um, I was brought up in the north of Glasgow, uh, one of six in a family. So there was lots of us. Um, my dad worked so hard, all the shifts, all the hours. And I think that's where I got my, you know, my drive at work to, to always do my best and do as much as I can to succeed. It definitely comes from the work he did. Yeah, so. yeah. Wonderful. And let's step into HR then. So um, I'm going to ask you, I'm not going to ask the same question to each of you through the whole session, but we'll, we'll kind of jump around a little bit. But um, I think this first one's important. So um, why did you both choose an HR career? Karen, do you want to go first? I don't think I chose it. I think it chose me, yeah. um, which happens a lot. Um, my background was in a lot of management offices and people would come with personnel questions back in the day and um, a company I worked for um, invested in me and asked me if I'd like to pursue the HR route and they supported university and stuff so it kind of chose me and I think it's it's part of my nature how I've ended up sort of I like people I like working with people watching them grow and and that's how I ended up in HR so I didn't quite choose it. Sounds like you're a natural though. Oh well maybe <laughs> ask the employees. <laughs> <laughs> what was your pathway in there? Uh, funnily enough, Karen and I have had this conversation <laughs> when, when we've met previously. Um, but similarly, I, HR wasn't my first career choice. I, I thought I'd study travel and tourism and have a glamorous um, career <laughs> jet setting around the world. Um, but that didn't work out. And then I took a grad role in uh, retail management and realised that customer service and inventory were also not for me. Uh, I I took an entry-level HR role and uh, everything just seemed to fall into place after that. 
Fantastic. Is it like a forever career, HR, do you think? Um, once you're in it, you stay in it? I think, you can, I mean, you definitely can do, but I think it gives you skills for all sorts of other areas of, you know, the business. And if you work with people and you understand people, it can certainly take you into, um, you know, maybe more specialised roles. Um, I've worked on sort of different individual projects, but the understanding HR was the basis of why I've moved over into that. And it was in technology, actually. So right. I think it can do. Okay. Let's kind of just start a little bit with what HR does because a lot of people will see HR quite transactionally they might touch it occasionally some will get very involved get a lot out of HR and part of the purpose of the pod today is to kind of actually demystify it mm -hmm. and, and perhaps encourage people to, to work more collaboratively with HR in, in their own organization but just give us an idea perhaps Nelly of of you know when you look at um, the main parts of HR, try and break it down as to what HR does across a business. Yeah, sure. I think um, for me, I mean, the overarching kind of purpose is to set the people and talent strategy of a business and make sure that that's aligned. But underneath that, there are many different facets, um, you know, from talent attraction and retention, learning and development, um, the way that we pay people and how we reward them, um, you know, moving people around the world, dealing with, um, I guess, performance um, plans, capability plans, development. It, it's it's quite a broad um, area um, that we focus on and certainly requires a lot of different skills. Right. And if you're progressing through your HR career, Karen, for example, do you have to get exposure to all of those things in order to get to an HR leader level or can you become a specialist quite early? I think you can. I think you can go down that specialist route. Being a generalist certainly gives you uh, a broad skill set, but perhaps that depth's not there, you know, it depends on what where you're at and, and who you're working with, what company, how it's set up. But I absolutely do think some of the HR leaders I've worked with have came through a specialist route, um, but have taken the time to understand the other parts, even um, at, at that higher level. Right. And is there, is there bits of the HR role that are just more enjoyable than others? Oh, absolutely. I, I know it's a much um, overused cliche, but there's a saying, choose a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life. And that's a mantra that I, I think has a bit of weight to it, right? So um, in HR, there are certainly elements that are less enjoyable, but overall, um, I don't think either Karen or I would be in our roles at, at the mm. ripe age that we are today <laughs> if um, we didn't, you yeah. know, overall love what we do. Yeah, yeah. And and. Is it too cheeky a question to ask what the parts of HR you don't like as much? That's not cheeky at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I freely tell people. Um, I think, like, uh, for me, the compensation and benefits stuff, the, the kind of numbers, because if you think about HR and, you know, it's about people and engaging with people, so that those parts don't really interest me. And it's had to be something I've really had to apply myself to and, and learn to, um, I guess, develop somewhat in the area so that I can bring that into my generalist role. I'm not yeah. sure about you, Karen. For me, it's the L&D side. Um, while I absolutely get the value of L&D, the right L&D at the right time to build the capability, for my, me actually doing the L&D piece, doing any training, that's not my favourite part. And I can't actually tell you why. I just don't get the buzz out of it that I get. I love recruitment. I love um, interviewing, piecing together the puzzle of the person with who we're looking for, the psychometric side of it. That's the bit I really um, enjoy as opposed to the L&D, not so much. I'm interested you said recruitment because I've... <laughs> that wasn't a setup. No, no. But <laughs> <laughs> when I've sp spoken to a lot of HR people, they often say, oh my, thank God you're doing the recruitment because I can't, I can't stand it. <laughs> and... and um, but I'm kind of going, well, if you love people, surely that's a big part mm. of the role is, is getting the right people into the business and yeah. or attracting and retaining the right people. But uh, I know a lot of HR people find it less than enjoyable. Yeah, no, and I, I understand that. Yeah. But actually when, when you've sifted correctly and you've got a good role profile and you've actually got candidates that have, you know, a lot of what you think, you know, what you know you're looking for, 
And then it's that person meeting and teasing out the parts I want to to find. And I, I love meeting people from all over the world, which this job allows me to do. I think for me, recruitment, it's the volume of the mm. work as opposed to the actual okay. process, right? Yeah. Um, that probably not my favourite part of HR yeah. either. <laughs> well, I, I know a good partner you can work with. <laughs> we'll get his details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might be sitting near you. Um, cool. Um, I'm curious as well around, and, and the listeners will be too, when they understand you know, understand more about HR through this podcast, they might be thinking, I wonder if it's a function that you know, I, I could go for. You know, I've, I'm not perhaps HR trained, but is it a function that you can move in and out of from other functions? I would say yes. I think um, for me, when you look at potential of people to be able to make cross-functional moves, whether it's into HR or marketing or supply chain, um, you have to look at their, um, you know, whether they have the agility, their learning agility to be able to learn that technical knowledge. And if people have demonstrated that, then I think the move is is possible um, because everything that we do in HR um, around that technical piece can be learned. Technical knowledge knowledge can always be learned. Um, And as long as you have that softer side around, you know, the self-awareness and those Mm. leadership qualities, then um, I would say definitely. And do do you see it happen in your businesses at all, people moving in and out of HR from other parts of the business? I have actually seen a a chemical engineer moved across into HR um, and became an HR leader. And it was a very um, heavy it was the operations side of the business. So what I, I think the leaders responded to that very well because she got what they they have to deal with daily mm. as well as kept them right from an HR perspective. So I have seen it happen, actually, and, and it was very successful. Right. And bear in mind, most of our audience is sales and marketing. Yeah. You know, does, does people in sales and marketing functions, could they have a crack at HR, it, do you think? It's an interesting question. Um, I've seen it in the reverse. I've yeah. seen a couple mm. of HR people um, at Campari Group go into uh, the sales function. So one with our third-party sales team did a, a 12-month secondment and uh, another one's gone into a commercial sales excellence role. So um, I haven't seen it. Maybe it's not that common, but, mm. um, you know, all those sales and marketing gurus out there, let us know if you <laughs> want a career in HR. <laughs> Watch this space, you might get a few, yeah. <laughs> a few LinkedIn reach outs. Excellent. Um, now, as you reach leadership stages in your HR career, what where do you go next? Do, do, you know, I ask this question a lot of um, sales and marketing leaders, and everyone assumes, oh, you go from leadership of a function to leadership of a business. So it's not always the case. There's lots of other things you can, you can do. What's the typical pathway in HR? Once you're on that leadership group, you're running the HR function. Is it about bigger HR roles or do you go to general management? What are the pathways? From from our perspective, it's I've just seen it go up through the HR um, chain. Uh, a couple have moved over into general management and they came from a, a, a different background originally, came into HR and then have swung back. And when they've went back, they've went back with, they believe, greater understanding of people and getting them to you know to motivate them and, and move them on um but from my perspective it's always it's been up through that hr chain mm. and, and i think i'd say you know when you think about again the qualities of what makes a great leader um self-awareness and mm. integrity and respect and empathy mm. for people leadership isn't about technical skills it, it's it's certainly something that you know an, a number of hr professionals would have those skills to be able to go into general management um i mean i know there's a number of companies where that's happened um i haven't seen it in in any of my companies mm-hmm. um and for me right now that's not an option but you never say never right yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you're right i thought on those softer skills there nearly mm. um I think no matter what the function you're leading, you of it's about leadership of people and connecting them to a strategy. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. mm-hmm. And that's the same no matter what function it is, exactly. whether it's HR, sales, marketing, operations. And, yeah. and, and then from the, the the general management point of view, it's just putting it all together. So conceivably that you know could happen, but uh, cool. Um, and talking about that leadership group, now you both sit on a leadership team, you report to the managing director of your, your businesses, um, as the HR functional leader, um, what is your overarching goal? And do you have 
KPIs in the same way that sales and marketers would recognize that measure the success against that goal? Yeah, yeah, we do. I do. Um, and part of that is delighted that the team down here have actually put an HR person here. They didn't have that before. So they're seeing the value of having HR at that top table um, to be part of the strategy, to understand how we're going to deliver the strategy, because it's through the people. You know, at the at the end of the day, um, so from that perspective, that's like a great step forward. You know, for the team here, uh, for William Grant. Yeah, and for us um, across the business in Australia, we all have a common KPI around the performance of the business. So it doesn't matter at what level you're at at or what function you're in, it is the same financial KPI. And then obviously everyone has additional ones that are function related. And for me, they're around the people and talent strategy and I guess creating um, a more collaborative culture across the the different functions that we have. Is that that measurable in terms of like engagement scores and yeah, engagement scores is one um, and there's other measures that we have around, um, you know, just some of the initiatives that we've done where it's involved people and we do um, pulse surveys after those. So, um, yeah, and I think it's important that we we find ways to measure those things. Mm. Yeah, and from a capability perspective, building that capability, we've got KPIs against learning you know, how are we going to engage people to learn? How are we going to show the value of that learning? What are we doing differently because of the investment um, in the capability building? That's a great, uh, a big KPI for us. Mm. When I work with HR and in my role in, in recruitment, you, you do quite a lot and, and you see a variety of HR leaders, some really engaged in the business, mm. some less so. Um, I often think one of the most interesting relationships in an organization is between the HR leader and the the MD or the general manager. That dynamic is just fascinating to to, to watch. Um, what role should the HR leader play with the the the, the business leader, the the MD or the CEO? Yeah, I think that's really important for me. If I think about not just Campari Group, but all the businesses um, where I've really thrived in my role and been able to, um, you know, perform at my peak, it's the strength of the relationship I've had with the leader. That's um, and it, it it's down to trust. You know, like if I think about the role, it's it's confidant, it's cone of silence advisor, it's sounding board, it's voice of reason or not sometimes, uh, ally, coach, and a bit of comic relief, I say, um, <laughs> yep. all, all bundled up into one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's that healthy challenge. You know, they are RMD, they are, you know, the, the general manager of the business, but for, for them to trust that my challenge is with great intent and for the, the greater good of the people and the strategy of the business, when you get that sweet spot between your, your lead, you know, your leader, your MD and yourself, it is a great place to work. And, and without being over flattering guys, when I've seen you guys interact with your MDs, I've, I see them. And I think that's where the relationship's really powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, because it, they, 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 it can be quite lonely being the MD. Mm-hmm. And I think the power of the relationship between the HR and, and is, is, I think, more important than any other function. It, it's almost like the, the, the chief of staff, right, in political terms. <laughs> you, you, I used to have an MD who would say his HR director was his left arm and his finance director was his right arm. I'm not sure how sales and marketing would feel about that, though. Get <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>, the legs. <laughs> there you go. That's a good tweet. Yeah. Yeah. As long as they're not the brains. <laughs> oh, um, well, let's look at the functional piece. Um when you go to the sales and marketing leaders, of which uh, the listeners are or aspiring to be sales and marketing leaders, what what role does the HR leader play with a sales or marketing director? Yeah, and I think understanding the function, understanding the business and what they're trying to do is key. To be able to talk their language helps to gain that trust and respect with them when you're guiding and advising them and understanding that they can sometimes be two very different, you know, animals from how they think, how they operate because of what they deliver and the roles they're in. If you can, if you can get your head around that and really understand that and display that for me, and it, that takes a bit of doing to get, you know, to understand the rules. I mean, I've been out on market with the guys. I've been out at some of our liquor stores. I've been in hotels looking through their eyes 
and and that has been a great asset for me to to speak to them about what we're doing with our people or how we're going to change their learning or or whatever. And I think that's what gets HR kudos. And I'm sure the listeners will tell us if it's not. <laughs> um, but for me, that's a respect piece as well, as well as understanding. I can do my job better when I understand what, yeah. they've, what they've got to deal with. Yeah. I think too, um, I don't think it's that dissimilar to the MD either, particularly with the senior leaders in sales and marketing in that, you, you know, sometimes you're helping them navigate their relationships, not just with each other, but with their boss as well or other people in the business. And so you're still coaching them too. And I think um, to Karen's point, the respect that you get in building those trusting relationships is through seeing the business through their eyes and really yeah. experiencing what they're faced with and being able to empathize and help them work through those challenges. Yeah. I, I, I love the concept of HR being close to the business and, and understanding the business. And that's what I think is great. When I work with HR leaders, um, for example, if I'm taking a, a, a brief and if it's with HR and the HR leader can't answer any of the questions, oh. you're, you're like, what? what do you mean you don't know the strategy mm. or you're not very sure of the commercial performance? And I get that the intricacies aren't there, but those who actually understand the rhythm of the business mm. stand out to me. They, re they really do. So your point, Karen, for mm. example, about being in market, mm -hmm. that, that's awesome. And I'm going to flip that back because I think a lot of um, our, our listeners will be perhaps first or second line managers. So mm -hmm. down from functional leads and thinking, well, how, how do I work more effectively with, with HR? Um, maybe a point to them is think about asking your HR business partner to come into market with you. Have ha, have a look at what you're doing. Get, give them exposure. Um, help them understand what your your role is. And, and is that a, is that something that you would see normally? Would someone come to you and ask for that, or is are, are you kind of the, the, normally the driver of that? I think it depends on the individual. Like there are some people who you know, ha have a plan or an idea and about how they want their career to develop. And so they will drive those types of um, interactions. And I'm, I'm all for that. I think, I mean, I think Karen and I both work in businesses that are probably, I, I would say, you know, medium sized, right? So the beauty of that is that we can touch everyone in the business. So you know, I, I should know everyone's name and face. And so having that connection is really important. I think it doesn't matter at what level. And so giving people the the comfort, if you like, to be able to reach out and, and set up those types of conversations. And likewise, if they're talent in the business that we've identified, for me to be able to reach out and have those types of conversations as well. So I would say to any first or second line leaders out there, yeah, approach them, dr drive it. You know, it's important for everyone to have a more than one career sponsor, if you like, in their in their world. So um, make make use of HR. Hundred percent agree. I would be delighted if some of these first line managers came and said, "Can I just have a chat about you know some of my?" I would uh, without me spotting it or seeing it because you can't see and hear it all. I would be delighted to support anyone that that came with that because and if they are on the talent, that's another you know great tick in the box that they're trying to get under, you know, understand their people and how to mo motivate them or, you know, help them to, to, to reach the objectives that we've set out. So, yeah. So proactivity would be really welcomed. Very much. Um, really. Yeah. So great lesson for those out there. If you don't know, you haven't mm -hmm. got a relationship with the HR, mm -hmm. BP or HR leader, then, then you know, yeah. We're quite nice, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, do, we don't tend to bite. <laughs> Not enough riding. Not unless we're, yeah, <laughs> provoked. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, now, if if you do, and this is an interesting part of your role, if you do see an individual or a team disconnecting or underperforming, um, do, do you step in? Um, so I have, but mo not in a in a sort of. Can we have a you know? Let's have a chat. How's things going? And then trying to see if I can tease out what I can see because then I'm heartened that ah they've got it. They maybe just don't know what to do with it. And then I can introduce various tools and um, things that the business uses to help teams connect or to help get that back. And I always try to think of it from a coaching side and not a telling side, um, especially when it's a young. Uh, new, when I say young, I mean new to the the role leader um, to help give them a little bit of confidence that that when they spot it, what to do with it. So um, I have um, st stepped in, and fortunately, it went well. Yeah, 
Yeah. Is it, and Nelly, from your side, is that um, that kind of level of operational involvement? You know, again, is that is that on HR to to proactively do that, or do you kind of typically wait for the functional lead to give you a nod and say, "Look, I could do some help here." I don't think you should wait. I, to Karen's point, you you need to see on a case by case basis and work out the best way to approach. So if you if I had a relationship with the person, I would probably do a check in of yeah, just a are you okay type conversation, um, or I would approach the manager and say, "Is there anything going on? You know, I've I've noticed this. Do we need to step in and support? How do we?" help help this person um but you should never wait for those types of situations because i think um it's all about being proactive and preventing rather than reactive and not retaining for well, example uh, absolutely the, the, yeah. the, the cost of yeah. replacing and recruiting is far yeah, more expensive than the cost of receiving <laughs> 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 oh, but you know recruitment at the right time is a great investment honestly <laughs> cool um, I want to spend a bit of time now just getting your perspective on advice on, on career management because uh, I think that's really unique. Mm-hmm. We haven't done this in the pod. Okay. Uh, we've heard from lots and lots of sales and marketing leaders um, and general managers, but I think the HR view we've, will be unique. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to this section. Now, what do you think are the factors that accelerate some careers over others? When people have got similar abilities, some people just manage to move faster and further than somebody else who's got a similar background and they stagnate. Mm-hmm. You know, what do, what do you th- why do you think that is? Well, for me, I will talk about how we define potential at Campari, and there's three very important elements. It's self-awareness, it's the agility that we talked about earlier, and it's aspiration. So I find that if you have all three of those, um, then naturally things you will move into other roles and you'll be open to other opportunities. You know, you you can't be closed off to opportunities and you you will progress if you are um, able to kind of see past the next step and how that next step may not be exactly what you'd always planned but is a route to what you got in your longer-term plan. Yep. Agreed. Self-awareness and drive, I would argue. You know, if you've got that self-awareness, it's a brilliant base for for everything you want to do in your career. And if that is go to a level or go even further, if you've got that, then I think that is it's the, it's the killer question. It's interesting. One of the, the main areas that we get into at AXR when we're, when we're um, interviewing somebody mm-hmm. is self-awareness, mm-hmm. you know, and it's a real differentiator, mm-hmm. you know, how self-aware is someone to what they bring in terms of their own strengths, but their own development journey. Mm-hmm. Um, and can they, do they understand the impact they have each each of that has on others around them. Completely. And, and some yeah. people are very, very selfish when it comes to self-awareness. Others are much more empathetic. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a real differentiator mm-hmm. to me. But um, mm-hmm. cool. What are the common mistakes you see in terms of uh, in, in terms of career mistakes? So I do think it's that um uh traditional linear career path where people will expect that the natural next step is the role above them. Um, I think people need to open their minds to how they can progress and that a sidewards move can actually be a wonderful development opportunity for the next upward progression. Um, I think that that's probably the biggest thing for me is people need to be a little bit more open about what they're willing to to do in terms of their their next job to to progress their career. Agreed. And for HR to have a vision of what that if could look like, the open mind, the communication on it. If if you're not quite sure or you're you're unsure of where you want to go, come and you know discuss it with your leader, discuss it with us, because there's we we are aware of opportunities that come up across the business that the leader perhaps wouldn't mm. have. And and I have personally done a sideways move mm. when I moved to Australia from um, Scotland and William Grant's been in the production side and now I'm seeing the distribution, the sales side and I think it's given me a greater view. I'm still in the same level but for that next level up I think it's given me a great view 
you know, from the, the very piece of grain coming in the door to the, the liquid going on their lips. I think it's um, it's been valuable for me. So to be able to talk about that and to show others the potential of a sideways or a, a different department for a project, mm. for yeah. instance, is invaluable. I think Cheryl Sandberg, Sandberg sorry, calls it um, no longer the corporate ladder, it's the jungle gym. <laughs> so it's a bit of a mess, right? But you've got to kind of work your way through it in order to achieve. So yeah. I quite J- like that. Jungle challenge. gym. We, yeah. We've had this <laughs> variety of phrases in, in, in 75 podcasts from, uh, and the most popular we had so far was career safari. But oh, jungle gym. I like that. Yeah. Jungle gym maybe takes the, uh, yeah. takes well, the, I, the, the mantle. I can't um, claim it. It is, <laughs> it is someone else. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, we'll have to get Cheryl Sandberg on the podcast. <laughs> I don't want to manage that somehow. But, um, I, I like the perspective there, both of you, because, um, it's another way in which an individual could re engage with HR because you, you do get very caught up in your world. Mm. You know, the, the issues and the challenges are important. Your function, you're delivering, you're moving at pace. Mm. No one's got time, but actually taking a step back and actually speaking to somebody who's, um, not just investing in your performance in that moment for that day, which your leader often is, but, um, is actually interested in you as an asset the business has over time mm. can give perspective to, Hey, have you thought about this and can actually force you to think more differently about your career if you engage with HR as, as, as well as just, you know, having your career conversation simply with your, your functional leader. So I like that. There was one other thing I thought about just back to your question about a common career mistake. And mm. I think the other thing is individuals need to own their development. So, so, um, I think when you talk about, you know, those that have accelerated progression, it's those people who drive it. So, you're responsible for driving your development discussions with your leader. You're responsible for driving your development conversations with the next level up and whoever those career sponsors are that you've indicated. Own that because that's the the way for you to, you know, be put on the agenda and, and have your development plan, I guess, solidified and given the stamp of approval. Mm. Absolutely. And we've just went through a big exercise at William Grant. So on PDP's career conversations, we had them in pockets. But the way I explain it is, if I don't know, how am I going to know? Mm. So trying to capture all of that, which we've done, the, the team have done great this year and the surprises that have came up and it is some salespeople looking to go over into marketing. It's some of our marketing execs wanting to go over into NAM roles, et cetera. And I'm like, I did not know that. So let me help. And and that's the stuff that we really get mm. excited about and yeah. um, to be able to watch that person progress. It gives, well, it gives me a, a nice sense of pride that yeah. I see others developing and in, uh, in, in the role. Yeah, don't sit on your ambitions. Involve mm. others in what Correct. you want to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 great. Yeah. Now, the world's evolving a lot, and I wanted to spend a bit of time just talking about um, what that means for people and culture. That there's, I, I guess, we're in a different world today than we perhaps were three, four years ago pre-COVID. What do you think is better about the working environment now compared to what it was three to four years ago? Nelly's got a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I think um, my thoughts are the world has finally caught up, that we are all so much more than our jobs and our careers. Yes, it makes up very a very important part of who we are, but, um, you know, our, our ways of working should adapt to our lives. And previously I think there was a big focus the other way. It was reversed. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it... It's not going to change. I have this conversation with my lead team a lot. I think some of them would probably like it to change maybe (laughs) a little bit, just a little bit more presence in the office. Um, But, you know, we're we're working pretty well at Campari. We've got people there predominantly 60% minimum um, of their time. Um, So I think think that this this is only a positive for us um, and that it's shown that people – can work from anywhere from the roof, you know, mm. if if they need to. Uh, absolutely. And we're pretty similar at William Grant's, but we've taken time this year to look at our culture. What is different now that we we are all in this hybrid, flexible mode now, you know, it's of three days a week. So we've actually got a project on culture and what does it mean for us now? And I think the only trick a lot of businesses missed as we were transitioning back is helping leaders to manage that 
in a different way. You know, you have leaders who want them all back in the office because they don't know how to do it any other way. So there's an education piece on there and giving them a bit of comfort on how to manage a remote team or a par remote team. And I think that was a bit that was missing. That's a really good point, actually. Um, it is on the organisation to help equip mm-hmm. the leaders how to do this because mm-hmm. uh, I think up to now, people have been kind of managing on their own a little bit yes. and trying to figure out, oh, yes. therefore they default, to your point, mm. the idea of getting them in the office because that's how I know that what they're doing mm-hmm. yeah. as opposed mm-hmm. to actually... Don't have to be, but but we've got mm-hmm. to help you understand how to do it, yeah. so you can develop you know confidence in your capability mm-hmm. to do that. We did take all our people on a modern workplace journey mm-hmm. um, globally, um, that that is continuing. So <laughs> um, there's some learnings from that, but I think specifically around the leadership point, I think yeah. Karen raises a really good point because that was a an all company type. Um, learning if you like yeah. and we probably do need to to work out how we can support those leaders who are used to what what we would call probably more traditional ways yeah. of working one of the questions that get asked a lot is from individuals who are concerned about career or or you know thinking about where they go next and um is about profile in an organization mm-hmm. and it's an interesting point when some people are working more in the office some are working more remotely Will the business defer to the ones who are in the office more for promotion, for opportunity, for getting involved in projects because you can see them? Or is this back to the point of actually we as an organization and a leadership group should learn to adapt to both communities because that's the way it's going to be? I don't, I don't think it's easy, but I'm no, curious of what your thoughts it's a, are. It's a really interesting um, topic to, to debate, I think. And I think the, what I... What comes to mind for me with that is if you are someone who wants to be a leader, what are, what are the leaders doing? I would be, I would be looking at the, the leaders and how they're role modeling to learn. And the majority of our leaders are in the office because they need to be. So they still have flexibility though. You know, it doesn't mean that they have to start bang on 8.30 and obviously finish at five. The flexibility is there for the days, but but having presence and being available and ready to interact, I think is important for leaders. And if you aspire to be a future leader, then you need to think about that and look at other ways to bring flexibility in. It doesn't just have to be working from home. Mm. I agree. And I think if that is your plan and you do want to progress and you want to have your work seen and valued, um, you don't have to be in the office, have a coffee meeting Mm. and just talk through your project with someone, get them to, you know, build that relationship that builds trust. And if, if Karen says she's off to do a project, she's going to produce something in three months produce it in three months. doesn't mm. matter where you've done it from. So I think there is a bit of, um, you know, getting your face in front of those that can help your career, but it's about open communication. Mm. And again, the relationship building, if you're just going to stay at home and not really interact, how am I going to know? Yeah. Mm. So if you, if you're performing, mm-hmm. then that's the bottom line. You've got to perform, right? Cause yeah. you know, yeah. that's, 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 that's the, 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 do a great job. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. involve others in, in what you're doing as well. Yeah. And, and, um, but look to those around you as role models. Yeah. And make yourself available, yeah. not yeah. necessarily FaceTime in the office, but yeah. make yourself available yeah. for FaceTime in other, yep. 100%. other ways. Yeah. Great. Mm. Yeah. Last question. Um, future of HR. What does it look like? Where is HR going to <laughs> where is it, where is it gonna go? Not your future. <laughs> Well, I think we need to look at AI. We need to look at um, digital acceleration. We need to look at getting quicker, sleeker, you know, with what we do in HR, that all that paperwork. And the fact yeah. is there's paperwork, right? We, you know, we need to get you enrolled in things and stuff. How do we get that smooth, quick, you know, sleeker? Um, we need to look at uh, DE&I. Uh, and CSR agendas, interviews now from people who are coming up to the, the the business asking for employment. That's what they want to know about, you know. HR, I've always said this, it follows society. <laughs> so if you think about all the things that Karen's just said, that's what's happening in the world and that's, that's what we need to do. We need yeah. to be conscious that, you know, the, the next generations are coming through caring about CSR. 
Uh, they are digitally savvy, so we need a one-stop shop app probably for them to do everything <laughs> related to their careers on their phone. Um, I think the DEI stuff, you know, and all the all the conversations we've seen about that in the in society, that that's we follow those trends. Um, so I think that's always the way that HR has evolved and will continue to evolve. Great. Guys, fantastic. Really enjoyed the conversation. I hope our listeners have as well. It's a different perspective. Yes. Talk, thank you. talk to you guys and, and, and uh, see my favorite HR leaders. So, um, <laughs> not to say other HR leaders aren't good no, as well. No, no. <laughs> we love them all. <laughs> thanks, but, Mike. Oh, thanks, Mike. R- really enjoyed it. Um, and thanks to you guys for listening. I think this is going to be one of our most downloaded pods. We'll find out soon, eh? Um, lots of really good advice and, and to, to help you guys get most of your career. So I would seriously encourage you to kind of listen to it, repeat it, download it, and just keep going because there's some re- absolute gems in there, guys. I really, really in- enjoyed it. Um, now, next up in the pod, we're meeting Tim York. He's the CEO of V2 Foods, Australia's most successful plant-based protein FMCG. So that should be interesting um thank you again nelly and karen and for me mike dixon keep listening to our podcast to help your future in sales and marketing i hope you enjoy today's podcast from axr recruitment and search we're passionate about helping you get the most out of your sales and marketing career keep listening as we bring you more career insights and advice from australia's top sales and marketing leaders. You just can't get this career advice anywhere else. My name is Mike Dixon. See you next time on Your Future in Sales and Marketing.